And my message today is titled, Hope Resurrected, Hope Resurrected. Uh, we just got out of Easter and the resurrection and what the resurrection accomplished. But today I want to share how the resurrection continues to resurrect. Yeah, it was about last summer, actually, I was uh, getting coffee in the morning and I'm looking out my windows and I see my daughter, she's up as well, and I see my daughter watering a dead plant in a flower pot right on our back patio. And I just kind of was standing there drinking coffee. I was kind of like, what is she doing? And I kind of, I'm talking to my wife on the side and I'm like, hey, Rachel, you know, what, what's Ava doing? That, that plant is dead. I mean, it's dead, dead. Like barely, like stems and, and, and shoots barely standing out of it. And my wife was kind of like, I don't know, you know, and we kind of just let her do it because it was kind of cute, you know, for a little girl, innocent, this innocent hope, you know, that she had that uh, this plant could come back to life. So we just kept letting her water it and she actually watered it for, for two weeks. It spoke to me and it speaks to me again when I think back on that moment watching my daughter water this dead plant um, because it made me think, do I see circumstances or situations that seem dead or appear dead? Do I see them the way she sees them? And do I see situations and circumstances through the lens of the resurrection? That there can be things that look dead, but then they come back to life. Things that they, they really do look like they're dead, dead. They're not coming back to life. And, and I mean situations and circumstances. So more of a metaphor right now in your life. But do we look at life with that kind of hope and faith that things could work out or things could be restored? Um, you know, the resurrection has really changed my view on this world. But if I'm honest, there's times where I don't always look at this world through that lens. Sometimes the things that are going on in this world do kind of make me believe that certain things or certain people aren't going to turn around. And so I can feel despair and I can feel like hopeless. But then I remember just like every year, you know, remembering the resurrection or remembering what God can do. And it revives, you know, it, it kind of resuscitates my hope that God really can restore and resurrect anything on this, on this earth and any situation. I want to talk to you real quick too about the power of the resurrection because it's the power of the resurrection that makes me believe that he can restore and resurrect anything in our lives. Uh, raising the dead happened before Jesus even resurrected. Jesus actually raised three people from the dead and brought them back to life. Now, the difference is they died again, which how weird would that be to, be to die and then die again? But Jesus, when he resurrected, he didn't die again. He's still alive. So that's the difference there. But one of the stories that really stuck out to me is in Luke chapter 7, and it starts in verse 11. This is what it says. This has to do with a widow's son that had died. Luke 7, verse 11 says, Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. The pallbearer stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. Isn't that wild? And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. And right away, already just, just reading this scripture, you know what the Holy Spirit's bringing to my thinking right now? Is, is the children that you parents and grandparents have been praying for, that you're saying, God, save 
God, restore, bring them to you. Lord, fix our relationship with them. Bring salvation into their life. You know, save them from their sins. I don't want them to go to hell. I don't want them to be separated from you and us in the family of God. I mean, this is what Jesus did. It says here in verse 15, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. For those of you who are wanting your children to come home to God, we're believing for that right now in Jesus' name, that he will begin to bring people home through this this crisis that we are going through in our world, that this would wake people up and be a wake-up call for people to come home. I'm believing that, and I'm believing that God can do that. If he can raise this young man from, from death to life, he can raise someone who's alive and bring them to himself spiritually and wake them up spiritually. Here's the crazy thing about this story. The funeral was already in motion. The son was in a coffin. The pallbearers were in place, but Jesus. But Jesus shows up and everything changes from that point. And the son's heartbeat begins to restart. So Jesus stops this coffin, stops the funeral, and then the son's heart starts again. How amazing, how beautiful that is. And the only one who calls himself the resurrection and the life would think of doing something like this. I mean, no one thought of that. No one thought, you know, hey, let's, let's have Jesus come up and touch. This was the first one. This was the first healing of someone coming back from the dead. The first raising of a dead person to life. This was the first occurrence that happened in the New Testament. Who would have thought of that? except Jesus, the resurrection and the life. Such a beautiful story. That's why it stuck out to me so much. The second person that Jesus raised from the dead was was Jairus' daughter, and she had been sick. And Jesus was gonna head to Jairus' house to heal her. And uh, well, he got stopped actually on the way by a woman who was bleeding. And she had been bleeding for over 12 years and no one could fix her. No one, no, there, was, there was no hope for her. She was in a hopeless situation. But she believed if she could just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, she would be healed. So sure enough, she's fighting through this large crowd and she touches his hem and, and, and she is healed. And Jesus stops and goes, who touched me? And it's kind of funny to the disciples because they're all like, hey, Jesus, we're crowded. Everyone's bumping into you. He's like, no, someone touched me. And he, he knew that power had left him. See, there's a difference between people being close to Jesus and people being faith and close to Jesus, having faith and being close to him. So she had this great faith to be healed. And then she bumped into him. She touched him. And that was the difference. And so she was healed. And Jesus said, you were healed because of your faith, because of her faith. Well, they begin to travel again to Jairus' home. And one of the servants shows up and the servant says, don't bother. Your daughter died. And so it just, it just really, you know, made it seem gloom and doom. And Jesus was like, no, no, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And what he means is she is dead, but he's going to wake her back up. And so he goes to the house. He brings in James, John, and Peter and the parents. And he says, Talitha kum, which means get up, get up, daughter, get up, child, get up, girl. And so she gets up and wakes up and she's alive again. She was dead. And then she's back to life. And they were amazed and people were shocked. At first they were laughing at Jesus saying that she's asleep, but they knew she was dead. And then they're, they're astonished because of what he did. That's, that's the power of Jesus. He can resurrect things. And this is before his own resurrection. And the last one is a famous one it was with Lazarus, his friend, Mary and Martha's brother. And Lazarus died and he was dead for four days. And you know the story, Jesus comes and he's late and they're bothered that he wasn't there in time. And they're like, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. So they believed that he could have done something. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And Martha says, yes. Well, he goes and he goes up to the, to the tomb and he calls Lazarus forth. He says, come out of that. And he does. And he comes back to life. That's three times where Jesus is really pointing to the power of the resurrection and he is that resurrection life. And that's so important that we understand that, that Jesus is. So I look at all these scriptures and these stories and I think, wow, that's amazing. But there's one more that's really bizarre and it's just so weird and out there. And I wanna read it to you. It's in Matthew 27 
and it's uh, verse 50. And this is when Jesus was dying on the cross. And he says this, Matthew 27, verse 50. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. And this may be the moment where he said, it is finished. And then he died. And at that moment when he died, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. That's the moment where the veil, the curtain between the Holy of Holies and all of us was torn, which means now we have direct connection with God. We don't have to go through a priest because first Peter says we all are the priesthood. Now we all can come to God directly, which is beautiful. But it goes on to say the earth shook and rocks split apart and tombs opened. Tombs opened at this moment when Jesus died. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. So just in case, you you know, you're trying to grasp what happened here. Basically, when Jesus died, things shook and tombs cracked open. But then, after he rose again, so did all these saints, these people that had risen from the dead, they too came out of their tombs. So Jesus' resurrection was so powerful that he actually made other people come to life. How amazing is that? Like the reverberation of his own resurrection woke other people up from the dead. And then they started visiting people in the city of Jerusalem. Now we have no idea what happened to them next because they don't record that. We have no idea if they died again or maybe it was their spirits that went up to be with, with Christ. All we know is, is that his powerful resurrection was so mighty and so effective that even other people rose again and started visiting people. Maybe that's where we get ideas of zombies and such, who knows? But that's incredible. So if Jesus' resurrection can do that, what else is he resurrecting? What else is he trying to resurrect in your life? When I read these scriptures and believe in the resurrection of Jesus, all I can think of is how the power of the resurrection continues to reverberate today. All I can think of is how there's hope for anything or any situation that seems or appears to be dead. And here's something important to take away. Just because something appears dead doesn't mean it is, especially when Jesus is around. Just because something appears dead doesn't mean it is. The resurrection power of Jesus has resurrected hope. The resurrection power of Jesus has resurrected hope. The hopeless feeling that nothing can turn around or come back to life is ironically thrown into the grave, nailed into a coffin, while hope through Jesus Christ stands triumphant over that grave. Just think about that for a second. Where it looked like the grave had won, now it's buried in itself. And now the living Jesus, the hope, the living hope is standing triumphantly outside of that tomb over graves, even causing others to rise again physically. But he did all that to save us and to help us resurrect spiritually. And I'll share more about that later. So we celebrate our salvation every Sunday, and I hope every day, because every day we're alive is a, is a day to, to worship and celebrate salvation from sin and death. Every day, we can also celebrate how God has resurrected us from terrible situations in our lives, because he's still resurrecting us and developing and growing and changing things. Like, think about this. Like, maybe you grew up in a home where God wasn't there, but he's resurrected you out of that and has changed your home. Maybe you were abandoned and he's resurrected you. He's called you his own child. You're no longer an orphan or abandoned. You're one of his children. Maybe your marriage was broken or your family was broken, but God restored that and God revived and resurrected your marriage. Maybe financial struggles or the loss of things in your life. Maybe it's a loss of people, but God has resurrected you out of that situation. Such powerful things are going on in your life, not just salvation, not just that he's resurrected you from sin and death, but he's also been working in your life in other ways, blessing you and giving you things. Not that we won't go through hard times. As I said last week, we will go through hard times, but we can know that in the end, we come out of it stronger and, and, and closer to God and victorious every time. But maybe there are some old 
or new situations and circumstances that you need or want to be resurrected in your life. Maybe you want to come out of those things. Maybe there's salvation in your family members, your friends, your coworkers that you've been praying for that Jesus would save them. Maybe there's friendships and marriages and families that still need to be restored, still need to be resurrected from the dead. Maybe there's freedom and deliverance from bondage and sin. That's only found in the power of Jesus Christ. Or what, what about our current crisis in our world? It seems like a lot of bad things are happening, but we can be sure that God's going to resurrect us out of that situation. We're going to come out of it alive. We are. And even if we were to die, like I said last week, we have eternal hope because we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. So this hope still lives and never dies. Here's the thing I want us to understand is don't give up hope. Don't give up hope because Jesus is resurrection and life. So I don't know what it is that you want to see a resurrection for, a metaphor as in you want to see something change and something come back to life, whether it's a marriage or a friendship or your child coming home, or maybe it's, it's the fact that they need to be saved, or maybe it's jobs and everything. Look, don't give up hope because the one you have believed in who takes care of you is the resurrection and the life. Look, circumstances and situations may appear flatlined, but with Jesus, there's still a pulse. Situations may seem flatlined, but with Jesus, there's always a pulse. Wherever Jesus is, there are signs of life. But there's something we need to understand so we don't get disappointed. Because I don't want to get your hopes up as I taught last week. There's something we need to understand so we don't get disappointed. Unless Jesus is welcomed, or comes into those circumstances, we won't see a resurrection. We have to welcome Jesus in. We have to invite him to do the work that he does in order to see a resurrection. If Jesus is left out of the equation, you won't see any change. That's just the reality, and that's just the honest truth, and I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you. I wanna tell you the truth every time I preach. Unless we invite Jesus in, you will not see a resurrection. So how are we going to see God resurrect our circumstances? Well, I actually think that something has to die before there can be a resurrection. Something has to die before there can be a resurrection. We have to crucify what's getting in the way of God for God to work in us. We have to crucify control, crucify pride, crucify or let go of the past Maybe crucify false expectations of people or, or, or your relationships, false dreams that, that God never wanted for you, but you thought it, that's what it is. Maybe, maybe it's sin. Maybe it's rebellion. We actually have to surrender all those. We actually have to crucify them, a metaphor, put them to death in order for the resurrection to take place in our lives, in order to see a change in our lives. God and sin don't go together. God and rebellion don't go together. When we repent, when we turn away from things, God is immediately there to rush in and move in and to take in and be part of our, our relationship with us. But he's not gonna bless us if we're sinning. He's not gonna turn our situation around while we're sinning because then we would give credit to that sin and not to God. And it's so important that we understand that today. He's asking us to repent of things, to turn away from things. Maybe it's to turn away from grudges. Maybe it's to turn away from hurt, to give those things up, to crucify them so he can resurrect whatever situation it is. And I don't know exactly, I could go through a, a long list of different things and it would take forever to apply. But I'm asking you to, to let the Holy Spirit apply these things to your life today. You know exactly what the Holy Spirit is speaking about right now in your life. So we have to put them to death. If you're, if you're the one struggling like you personally, and you need a resurrection from something in your life, here's the key. You have to humble yourself. I've had to humble myself. I've had to admit things that are not right so that God can bring me out of them. We have to let Jesus in. So here's another important takeaway. If we try to change the circumstance with our own power, we will fail. We can't do it. If you don't let Jesus into your situation, there is no hope. Just the bottom line there. Invite him to help change your heart, even change your feelings. 
your past, your present, whatever has gripped you, ask him to set you free. If you're trying to change someone, maybe you're in a situation where you're trying and praying and hoping that someone would change, that their situation would resurrect and that it does benefit you. Or maybe it's a relationship or a family member or some sort. If you're trying to change someone and they aren't changing, we actually need to step aside. We actually need to stop trying to be the savior and the resurrection power. Our desire to control or manipulate doesn't resurrect. Only Jesus is the resurrection and life. So we need to crucify our worry, our fear, our control and our efforts and let Jesus move as we do what? As we pray. As we let go and as we pray, let Jesus move. I think about the story of Jairus and and Lazarus. Time was actually a factor in there. Jesus was late to both, but he still resurrected them. Trust God's timing. Trust his timing. Pray and, and seek God for that resurrection. But remember this, that if the other party doesn't want to be resurrected, you can't force it and you probably won't see a resurrection. I'm not trying to pop your hopes. I'm just trying to keep them humble and real. I'm trying to keep them sober. The idea that, that if, if no one wants to change, well, Jesus isn't going to force himself upon them. He's a gentleman. He's not going to make someone change if they don't want to change. All we can do is ask God to have grace and mercy and to move in their life and their heart mightily, to humble them, to get their attention. But for the most part, we have to pray and not worry and give them over to God and wait on his timing. I pray that you would do that in your life or whatever situation. So I'm wrapping it up here and I want to let you know that my daughter, well, she kept watering that dead plant. She watered it and watered it daily. Ava had a hope, she had a hope um, to to see this plant come back to life. And, And to our surprise, a new shoot, a new stem started growing and breaking through the surface of that, that plant, that pot. It was pretty cool. We had to take away the dead stuff and all of a sudden we see this new shoot coming up out of the water and, and she kept putting water in. And I think about that with Jesus because the Bible says Jesus is the living water. And I'm thinking, man, if we could only just keep putting Jesus in our situation, something's going to happen. There's going to be a resurrection in our situation. And right now with this COVID-19, if we keep putting Jesus in, we won't be feeling like things are dying around us and, and that bad things are going to ruin our lives and, and that our jobs are done and, and everything's over and the world's over. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen next, but here's the truth. If we keep Jesus in, the living water of life will be flowing and you'll come out of this better and stronger and healthier as a follower of Christ. And we need Jesus to come in and we need to keep praying Jesus into those situations that appear dead, but it doesn't mean they are. God has the final say. The cross and the resurrection has the final say, not you, not me, not the other people, not this world. God is gets the final say. When everything seemed like it was, all hope was lost, Jesus rose again. When when that kid was in the coffin, Jesus touched it, spoke life to that kid, and he rose again. See, that's, that's Jesus. He gets the final say in your situation. So don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. My last takeaway is Jesus resurrected us from sin and eternal death. So no circumstance is too dead for God. No circumstance is too dead for God. I can't stop praying and hoping. I can't. I, the resurrection, it just, it just teaches me to never give up. It teaches me that life is triumphant over death. And so I'm going to go to my grave praying for people to come to Jesus I'm gonna go to my grave praying that God would restore and heal situations and relationships and families. I'm going to my grave doing that. Why would I not? There's always hope as long as Jesus is alive and he's never going to die. He is alive. He is the resurrection and the life. He is eternal life. So there's always hope. But I do know this, that Jesus has to be welcomed in. Jesus has to be invited in. Jesus has to show up in order to see that resurrection 
take place because he is the resurrection and the life. There's an important thing I need to make sure we understand today in closing here. For those of us who, who want our physical circumstances to change, but we haven't had a spiritual change, that's so important today. I'm talking to you who have never believed in Jesus, who, who are, the, what the Bible says, it means you're spiritually dead. It says this in Ephesians chapter two, once you were dead because of your sins, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Paul is talking to a church that already believed in Jesus and, and was saved. But for those of us who are not saved, the Bible says you're dead in your sin and you need a resurrection, a spiritual resurrection. And that God did it in his great mercy. He gave Jesus up. It's, it's ironic because he gave Jesus to die so that we could come to life. So he answered the, the sin issue with the, the death of his son. But when Jesus rose again, we too rise again. And if you haven't believed in being spiritually resurrected, given a new life, a new birth in the spirit of God, then you need to consider that. Because what good is it to have physical changes in your life? What good is it to even be healed? What good is it for your family or circumstances to change, but then you're not going to heaven or you're not gonna have eternal life? Because here's the thing, sin is eternal death and separation from God. There is no hope in the end of sin. There is none. But because of what Christ did for you, if you put your trust in Jesus to save you from your sin, you get eternal life. And even now you are blessed. Even now you're promised the, the presence of God with you. And, and it's, it's amazing because he has saved you and now he lives inside of you. And now that same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you and brings life to your bodies, brings life to your soul and your spirit. And so you overcome sin and death. And on top of that, if, if Jesus has overcome sin and death for us, he's gonna overcome and resurrect other things in our lives and other areas in our lives. So I wanna encourage you today to put your trust in Jesus and, and pray to Christ and say, Jesus, I need you today. I realize that I am a sinner. You can do that right now with me. I realize that I'm a sinner I realize that Jesus died and rose again to give me a rebirth, to save me from my sin and eternal death, and instead to, to set me free and forgive me of my sin and give me eternal life. I believe Jesus did that for me. And now I give you my life. I, I receive you and now I live for you because of what you've done for me. I believe in this God and I'm praying this in my heart and with my mouth today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that and you said that from your heart, you have to understand something that you have changed spiritually. When you put your trust in Christ, you have been changed spiritually and you're gonna see some changes as well in your heart and attitude towards life and sin and God. And it's amazing. And if you did pray that today, would you let us know by going to calvarydover.org and click on connect with us and let us know your decision so we can contact you immediately and send you some things and just wanna pray with you and talk to you. So church, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Hope has been resurrected because of the resurrection. It's amazing. So keep your hope and pray Jesus and believe Jesus to show up in situations that appear dead but with Jesus, there's always hope for them to come back to life, to resurrect. I love you so much. I thank you for joining us here. And, and I just wanna let you know, thank you so much for being here every Sunday, watching and being a part of our service. Thank you so much for your giving as well and your, your faithfulness to giving. Um, it's been amazing. We've been covering every need that's come in and we've been uh, being able to continue to function and continue to do ministry here at Calvary and in our community. And if you're not aware yet, we actually started something called Get Boxes of Hope. And it's uh, Boxes of Hope and it's getboxesofhope.com. So if you know a family member or families who need help with food or supplies, let them know about that website. Calvary is partnering with the originators, the, the ones who started this movement. Calvary is a partner with them. And so now we're dealing out hope 
every week. We've been giving so many boxes away. It's awesome. And so we just want to encourage you to, to share that. And again, that's another reason why we want to say thank you for your continual support uh, to our church. And we love you guys. We pray you have an amazing week and we'll hopefully be seeing you soon. God bless.